A one-week-old baby was brought to the clinic by his anxious mother. There was excessive accumulation of saliva and mucus in the nose and mouth of the baby. She described episodes of gagging and the baby turning blue after swallowing milk, as well as the abdominal distension after crying. The physician was not able to pass a catheter into the stomach, and plain x-ray of the abdomen showed air in the infant's stomach. Physical examination of the chest showed signs of pneumonia. Which of the following congenital anomalies could be the cause of this condition? This is a question that you have to look at a few different keys that are showing up. One is that there was an accumulation of saliva and mucus in the nose and mouth of the baby, and the gagging without um, an accumulation of large amounts of food and not vomiting will be a sign that there's a short pouch. There's also difficulty passing a catheter, which means there's probably an atresia. If you look at the chest, you're getting air into the stomach, but with an atresia, there must be another um, way of connecting the two, so you're also thinking about a fistula. And the only option in this one that has a fistula and an atresia is E, the esophageal atresia with a fistula between the end of the esophagus and the trachea. The gagging and coughing would be the associated fistula that has a connection to the developing trachea. Hi, I'm Dr. Rusty Jennings. I'm the director of the esophageal atresia treatment program here at Children's Hospital in Boston. We're also an associated hospital with Harvard, so I'm also an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. And I'm here to talk to you today about esophageal atresia. Now, esophageal atresia is a relatively uncommon problem. It only occurs in one in three to 5,000 pregnancies, so most people don't know a lot about it. When you think about the esophagus, you think about swallowing going from your mouth to your stomach. Esophageal atresia is when that tube doesn't develop correctly. So let me show you what a normal esophagus is. This diagram shows a trachea. There's the vocal cords here, the epiglottis, which keeps you from inhaling food, and the trachea, which is the tube that, you, uh, that moves the air in and out of the lungs. Here in brown is the esophagus going from the back of the mouth all the way down to the stomach across the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the breathing muscle that separates the abdomen from the chest. So the esophagus acts as a conduit for food. And intimate between the two is the wall. Each of them has a wall very close to the other, and that's why you can't talk about one without talking about the other. So here we have various forms of esophageal atresia or esophageal maldevelopment. We can start over here in the simplest form. Remember that common wall, or this intimate wall between the trachea and the esophagus. Sometimes that doesn't form correctly, and a little hole forms, and we call that hole a TEF. That stands for trachea esophageal fistula, and a fistula is just a hole or an abnormal connection. Other anomalies in the esophageal development spectrum include the most common form. This is called the type C esophageal atresia where a little portion of the esophagus didn't develop. It just never occurred to the esophagus to make a formal connection. So we end up with a blind ending pouch, no communication to anything, and the distal esophagus, or the part on the bottom connected to the stomach, connects right into the trachea. So when this baby breathes air in, some of that air can go down into the stomach. And when this baby swallows liquid or saliva, it doesn't go anywhere. It stays in the back of the baby's throat and causes the baby maybe to cough or something like that. So this is called type C, and this connection right here is called a TEF. Other versions which are similar to this would occur when we have a short segment of esophagus missing. We have the distal tracheoesophageal fistula, but we also have an abnormal communication up here. So in here, we have two TEFs, one proximally and one distally. Now these two types of 
uh, esophageal atresia, so it's called short gap or type C variants with the proximal tracheoesophageal fissure are relatively easy to fix. Almost all pediatric surgeons can fix these. And it merely requires dividing the fistulas and reconnecting them. But there's another type of esophageal atresia which is more difficult. And that's pure esophageal atresia. And pure esophageal atresia, or so-called long gap esophageal atresia, you may see the terms L, G, E, A for long gap esophageal atresia, really refers to these. And this is where the bottom part of the esophagus, this part, never connected up to the trachea. There's no fistula up here for the bottom segment. So you have a much shorter portion of distal esophagus, which only goes from here to here, as opposed to this part, which goes from here to here. And what we are left with is a gap here, which is relatively long, and that's where the long gap comes from, as opposed to this gap, which is usually relatively short. So in long gap esophageal atresia, this part can be of different length. This is not a simple problem, but has multiple variants which can be progressively complex. And in extreme, we may have a segment of the lower end, which say is three or four centimeters long, or we may have this lower end of the esophagus, instead of being above the diaphragm right here, it might be a little nubbin like this, well below the diaphragm. And almost all pediatric surgeons would say that when you have a situation like this, that's this far apart, it can't be fixed. But I will tell you, using Dr. Folker's process of esophageal growth, not stretching, growth, you can always fix these esophageal atresia babies.